Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to this webinar. Uh, I'm Julian Legrand. I'm a professor at the Marshall Institute at the LSE. Uh, and we're very pleased today to be able to host this webinar that um, will comprise Justin Smith, uh, who is going to talk to us about uh, his new book, uh, Irrationality, which we're looking forward to hearing about. Um, uh, Justin is a, a, a professor of history and philosophy of science at the University of Paris. Uh, he's authored several books, including, of course, this one. Uh, he's a regular contributor to the New York Times and Harper's Magazine. His research interests look like uh, Leibniz, early modern philosophy, classical Indian philosophy, and, and the history and philosophy of anthropology. Um, all of this, of course, fails into insignificance besides his real achievement, which is that he has um, an asteroid named after him. Uh, perhaps he'll quite tell it, perhaps he might tell us as to why that, how that came about. Um, uh, we're also going to hear from some comments um, on, um, on uh, Justin's work from Richard Bradley, uh, my colleague from the Department of Philosophy, he's a professor of philosophy um, at the LSE. Um, he's worked a lot on decision theory, on formal epistemology and the theory of social choice and written a book, The Decision Theory with a Human Face, and it looks at decision making under conditions of severe uncertainty. And he's done a lot of work in recent years on policy decision making under uncertainty, including uh, looking at the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, what's going to happen is that um, Justin will um, uh, tell us um, the sort of principal thesis of the book. Mm -hmm. Uh, for about 20 minutes. Um, then uh, Richard, for about uh, eight minutes, will reply. And then um, I might throw in a question or two. Uh, and then we'll move to Q&A, and hopefully they'll have about half an hour for Q&A. We will be finishing uh, on the dot uh, of six o'clock. Seven o'clock, seven o'clock, seven o'clock. I said six o'clock last time. I should say seven. Um, so, um, Let's go. Um, let's go straight on to um, Justin. Over yes. to you. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. First of all, I'm really delighted to be here with you this evening. It's an honor uh, and a pleasure to be able to go back and uh, to talk about this book. Uh, you've described it as new, and I suppose 2019 is new. But the truth is, I already feel uh, like uh, it's old. Uh, in part because it emerged out of a very different uh, political and world historical moment, a pre-pandemic moment. And I feel as if much has changed, much, much has changed in the world and much has changed with me personally, moving on to other philosophical projects. Uh, that's one preliminary comment. Another has to do with the tone and focus of it. I uh, feel, uh, almost guilty uh, having a, 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 a rational choice theorist uh, like Richard uh, 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 commenting on this work because it's plainly meant for a non-specialist audience. It's meant uh, to be read widely and to engage with some of the issues that rational choice theorists and people in related formal fields in philosophy care about, but to do so tangentially uh, in a much looser and freer style. And so I hope that's clear uh, uh, to you, Richard. And uh, I hope also that will uh, be part of the appeal uh, to some of the people uh, listening tonight. Um, now, I, uh, there are a lot of different reasons I first became interested in sort of the broad history of the idea of rationality in philosophy. I'm first and foremost a Leibnizian, that is to say a follower or a, a student and a scholar of the work of Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, uh, who was committed to a couple of uh, bedrock principles of reason uh, and was also committed, he's known as a rationalist for complicated reasons we don't have to discuss, and was also committed to the idea or the hope of a near future in which, as he thought, we would outsource 
a number of our lower and more drudging functions of reckoning or computation to machines, right? Uh, mechanical devices that could do arithmetic for us and that could also eventually, Leibniz thought in the 1670s, do concept crunching for us. Um, and he thought that this could happen uh, while at the same time uh, human beings would be able to deepen and cultivate their own faculties of reason more fully by not having to do the sort of work computers would end up doing. And this is an interesting question because obviously Leibniz doesn't think reasoning is the sort of thing machines can do for us. Well then, what is it and what has gone wrong? This is a subtext and the focus of my next book uh, coming out later this year. What has gone wrong in a world where we uh, conflate reasoning with the sort of algorithmic processes that can be uh, outsourced to machines that are in other respects not rational, right? So what is this other thing that rationality might be? Well, there's a basic sense in which, you know, I, I argue that there is no uh, uh, definitive simple definition it's a family resemblance term, or it's a term for which there are several different instances that you need to study as on a sort of carousel, and also that it's better to look at the contrast class. What is irrationality? Um, from a historical point of view, irrationality is often invoked where people fail to adhere to a certain handful of basic uh, rules of inference. Um, and this, for this reason, I, I had to delve somewhat more deeply than I had originally thought into classical logic and rhetoric. Uh, Cicero is, a, is an important figure in the book. Um, and what struck me in reading classical logic uh, is that nearly every late antique doxographer, um, that is author who's interested in uh, kind of summarizing what philosophers have done up until this point. Uh, Diogenes Laertius is the most well-known of them. Invariably, these authors, when they're engaging with logic, they immediately zero in on all of the famous fallacies of logic, the points where logic has gone wrong, and they recite uh, the fallacies and sophisms uh, uh, that uh, plainly are there to instruct people about how to use their reason correctly, but are also just there to amuse them. Students of logic and later doxographers want to be amused by the sophism. So you're reading a logic text and you find examples like this goat is yours, this goat is a mother, therefore this goat is your mother, right? It works better in Latin where the yours uh, is, is the same in both cases. Um, and so logic turns out to be for much of its early life, a sort of um, a, a collection of uh, insider jokes. Um, and this has been, appealing to me as a kind of historical fact, and this continues into authors like Pierre Gassendi in the 17th century and even you know, into the, well into the 18th, the idea that, um, that, that, that students uh, dedicated to the task of improving their reason, of uh, learning the rules that enable them to make proper uh, inferences, are invariably also attracted by the pull of that kind of thinking where, uh, where, where it doesn't hold up, where it fails, where something goes wrong, and where the logical inference ends up looking like a joke, 
right? So one of the uh, kind of uh, moments on the carousel in thinking about what irrational, the, the irrational is, dwells at some length on humor. We need to pay attention to humor because humor is one of the paradigm instances or loci in uh, human thought where uh, we uh, 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 celebrate or heighten the kind of failure of rational inference. A joke with a punchline is like an inverted or perverted or curdled uh, logical inference. Um, jokes also exist kind of, again, on this carousel going around to different moments of irrationality with several other representative mo instances or uh, examples, uh, 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 exempla, as they would have said in classical thought, of what irrational irrationality might be. Another uh, uh, exemplum um, is dreaming. And I think this is one of the uh, best, uh, most illustrative moments in the book for trying to understand uh, what the contrast between reason and unreason is. Um, as we all know, in the early modern period, uh, uh, most uh, 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 famously with the work of René Descartes uh, in the Meditations of 1641, uh, the central aim of modern philosophy comes to be a kind of sustained effort to demonstrate, to establish uh, to everyone's satisfaction, or perhaps only to the author's satisfaction, that our waking life is really our waking life and not a dream. Uh, at the same time, Descartes is in uh, correspondence with Jesuit missionaries in uh, the Americas, in New France, for example, where people are living in cultures such as among the Huron, where dreams, quite by contrast, do something very different. They ground reality, right? You have a dream about a raven flying from the north or something, and you wake up and you think, I have a concrete information that I can translate into uh, my practical rationality, so to speak, and uh, it shapes the nature and character of your waking life and your waking actions. And so these Jesuits were kind of sharing in the same spirit as Descartes, thinking, get me out of here. This makes no sense. Now, why does it make no sense? Well, because we think our ontology of dreaming is that it's entirely generated by our own uh, kind of excess uh, uh, so, uh, neurological activity uh, 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 producing images where the things, strictly speaking, are not. Um, but deeper than that, we also don't like the kind of rigorous and consistent violation in our dreams, uh, at least in my dreams, of uh, the law of the excluded middle. Um, of the, um, the fact that uh, so often in a dream, uh, 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 things blend into one another, something that it, something can be and not be the, the thing that it is. Uh, my landlord can be my grandfather and not my grandfather and so on. Um, it gets weird in there. And this has long been one of the kind of basic uh, criteria for separating out rational thought from irrational thought. It's there in Aristotle, it's there in Leibniz, it's been, so to speak, the anchor of the tradition of uh, uh, Western philosophy since antiquity. And in the modern period with Descartes, the project of the meditations is, so to speak, to make this uh, once and for all uh, something that we can safely ignore, right? That we can uh, 
uh, pack our stuff under our pillow when we wake up and then get about the important business of, um, of ascertaining uh, the proper rules of rational inference in our waking lives on the, uh, on the mind side and then on, on nature side, uh, the, 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 the laws of nature, right? Um, and this has been fairly uh, predominant uh, ever since. Uh, certainly, we have movements like psychoanalysis that uh, try to uh, kind of um, recenter again uh, the uh, the dream life and to make it meaningful, to make it matter for the shape and character of the waking life. But I would argue these have always been uh, counter movements, um, and uh, they've been very much against. Uh, the, uh, the, the prevailing uh, commitment that we continue to share that, uh, that, that dreams uh, need to be bracketed because they make no good proper sense. Now, just to conclude uh, uh, in the two to three minutes I, I, I have left, I, I also wanted to add that there are political dimensions to this, of course, as well. Another uh, kind of uh, moment rotating around the carousel and encountering different forms of irrationality is uh, uh, that kind of experience uh, in which your sense of individual identity uh, uh, blends into uh, uh, the, uh, the identity of the mass or the crowd. Uh, and this is something uh, that um, can happen in politically uh, anodyne situations such as rock concerts or uh, in uh, mass political movements as well. Um, and uh, uh, this is something that happens in new and curious ways in the context of widespread uh, disinformation that the internet is facilitating that I'm not going to cover, but is yet another moment on the carousel. Now, one final thing that I wanted to emphasize, and then I'll, 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 I'll be quiet, is uh, that uh, the book uh, is neither a self-help book uh, to learn how to think better, um, nor is it um, a, 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 a celebration of either rationality or irrationality. It's, uh, I think, uh, trying to adopt a kind of, so to speak, vulgar dialectic approach that uh, moves back and forth between the two poles uh, and characterizes human life as in a balance between them. Uh, and also that uh, 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 sets up these two poles as uh, uh, poles that one is free to move between according to circumstances. And just to, to conclude, that's what's so striking about uh, the degeneration of uh, classical logic texts into joke books, that this shows kind of the way uh, someone who engages with logical inference is also dabbling in sophism and uh, 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 flirting with the risk of being accused of being a philosophaster or a uh, sophism mongerer or someone who delights in unreason under the disguise of reason. Right, um, so it just keeps bouncing back and forth between the two poles throughout history, and that's why it's such an interesting and fascinating topic. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Justin. Um, so, uh, Richard, over to you. Yes, thank you very much. And I, I think I, you know, I should start by saying that uh, uh, I mean it's a fascinatingly rich book. And I mean, and I have no hope as it is of doing uh, justice to anything but a very small part of it. And 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 also, you know, the, the dialectical. I'm I'm going to sort of brutally ignore the dialectical character of much of what you say, in the interest of sort of pulling out something that I can in, engage with in the, in the five minute minutes that I have. But I, the audience should be sort of aware of just how selective that I'm being here, and you can of course we'll continue the dialectic afterwards. Sure. So, um, 
I mean, recent decades have given uh, us lots of reason to despair, particularly uh, if you count yourself as a child of the Enlightenment. Um, you know, everything from the 2007-8 financial crisis, the recent, you know, dramatic effects of the coronavirus and our sometimes floundering responses to it, and the ongoing climate crisis have all, I mean, amongst many other examples, attested to the lim to the various limitations that we face, limitations in the ability of science to predict and control events, limitations in our ability to control the effects of the, the very institutions that we ourselves have created, and finally, limitations in our ability to reach agreements about how to restrain our own actions, even when we have strong common interest in doing so. Um, and I mean, to add, you know, add uh, insult to injury, we face, perhaps not, not uniquely, of course, but we've gone through a phase in which science skepticism and populism have reared its mm -hmm. ugly head in many parts of the world. Um, so lots of grounds for despair. And I mean, the, the question that one wants to ask is, wh where did it all go so wrong? Um, I think Justin Smith has a sort of answer in the book, or he proposes an answer in the book. Um, he thinks, at least partially, the, it's the very pursuit of the Enlightenment project, the, the reckless pursuit of rationality that has engendered these irrationalities. Um, I mean, I'll just pull out a couple of quotes from the book to sort of bring out the, how dramatic the thesis is here. He says, for instance, the harder we struggle for reason, the more we lapse into unreason. And then elsewhere, uh, uh, the drive to improve, to in, to in, the drive to improve rationality, to make people and society rational, uh, mutates as a rule into spectacular outbursts of irrationality. And then he concludes, and this is the sort of advertised main thesis of the book: it is irrational to eliminate irrationality, both as a society and in the exercise of our mental faculties. So that's the question that I want, I mean, the question I want to ask is, is that really true? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, is it true that rationality inevitably engenders irrationality? And is it irrational to pursue the elimination of irrationality? Mm -hmm. um, well, there's sort of two kinds of thoughts that go on in, 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 in Justin's book and that, that give support to this. Um, so one is a kind of, and I think is the really the inessential one, but it's important in some of the details too, is this kind of Foucauldian thought that the more we attempt to identify, classify, codify rationality, to sort of work out what it is and what its various dimensions are, uh, the more, as it were, we engender a richer and richer picture of irrationality, because these two are conceptually tied at the hip. There's no, they have to be understood in opposition to one another. So, so quite literally at a conceptual level, irrationality is, a, is given, is, you know, is born along with rationality. But I think that's not where the worry is, really. The worry is about the effects in, in the world itself of the pursuit of reason, whether you know, the worry is that the Enlightenment project of applying reason to, uh, to effect social progress has somehow landed up doing the opposite. Mm -hmm. And in Justin's book, there are many examples of the sort of uh, uh, way in which this might happen. And I mean, these examples stretch, you know, right across from antiquity to the modern era and all different facets of life. And we've got something of a picture of that today as well. But, but I think in the end, they don't amount to the case um, for, the, for his claim. And, and, and they're really this, the, there are sort of two reasons for this. I mean, what, one is a sort of somewhat minor one, is that a lot of these um, uh, uh, effects of the pursuit of reason are bad effects without being irrationalities. I mean, they're bad effects that have complicated causes and the, the, the reckless pursuit of, of rationality may be part of the cause, but the bads themselves are not strictly irrationalities. So these sort of obvious examples of this are where, you know, science leads to the development of technologies which are then misused and terrible things happen. Uh, yes, uh, so rationality, in a sense, this is an out you know, this is part of, a, it's a consequence of the pursuit of reason to some extent, but the consequence is not itself an, an irrationality, it's an unfortunate bad. As it were. But, but I think the main point here is really that the, the relationship between rationality, the pursuit of rationality, the attempt to affect social progress through the application of reason, and these kind of ill effects, these irrationalities, um, is 
uh, to my mind, a contingent relation rather mm -hmm. than a necessary one. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, this is this is really where I think uh, the I want to resist what the claim of the book. Um, and it's important because if this uh, if irrationality is you know literally entailed or is a necessary consequence of the pursuit of rationality, then in some sense we're doomed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we are either the must give up on the exercise of reason. Uh, or we must, or we continue with it, knowing that it will do nothing but produce harm and will produce mm -hmm. produce its opposite. Um, and uh, 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 but if the connection is merely contingent, then we can do something about it, mm -hmm. and that's important. And in particular, we can do something about it by understanding how it is that these effects, the effects of the pursuit of rationality, uh, produces these bads. And indeed, I mean, uh, more than that, I want to say that we've actually made a lot of progress already on precisely these questions. Um, you know, the, the uh, I mean, naturally, uh, sort of coming coming from the decision sciences, I would want to advertise that there. there's been a lot of work on the bounds of human rationality, the ways in which bounds, both in our own cognitive abilities, but also bounds set by the environment, affect our ability to to pursue goals effectively. But perhaps the most important example of this is uh, uh, the development of game theory and uh, the discovery, if you like, uh, at least a discovery in a precise form, the way in which um, individual, perfectly rational individuals pursuing their version of the good uh, as best as they can, can through their joint efforts land up in a situation that is one that none would have wished. Um, the, the classic example of this is the prisoner's dilemma game, which in some way has become the emblem mm -hmm. Of our inability of you know, the emblem of public, the problem of providing public goods of one kind or another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, the lesson of, of this discovery in game theory, but I think the larger lesson in, this, in, in the work that's been done on on the limits of human rationality and the, and the, the byproducts of uh, incautious or imprudent pursuit of reason is not that. Uh, these effects can't be curtailed, but but that we need to be very very careful to the kinds of incentives that are in place. So I mean, the, the game the game theorists will always tell you, you know, it's not just about what, uh, it's not just about whether people are rational, but about the incentives that they face. And uh, in, in order to kind of mm -hmm. offset some of the ill effects of these things, we need to pay attention to these things. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the point the point I think is a much broader one that really, if we want to, if we want to solve the problems that we we face. There, there, there really is uh, no other path that we can pursue other than to improve our understanding of these effects. Mm -hmm. Take the current climate crisis. I mean, that was the one of the examples that I started with, where I, I mean, uh, our, uh, the limitations in our ability to kind of reach rational agreement are particularly in stark on stark display in this area. Mm -hmm. And yet, how else will we make progress on mm -hmm. on this issue than by coming? By the application of reason, both through the natural and social sciences, to understand the natural and social forces that are shaping us here, and in particular to understand what it is that's preventing us mm -hmm. from reaching uh, rational agreement or mm -hmm. good agreement in these kind of cases. Mm -hmm. There is, I think, really no other game in town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, well, uh, Justin, I think we probably would like to hear, I, I must confess, um, I read the book um, and then asked myself at the end, are we all doomed? Mm -hmm. um, uh, are we all doomed? You know, I, I, I worry a bit now, and this worry has come up before, it's not the first time, but part of the appearance of disagreement has to do with um, the kind of obligatory positioning of book marketing uh, and of, of that uh, 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 is to my mind uh, unfortunate and necessary and has also in parentheses I would say to do with um, the excessive dependence on uh, algorithmic marketing on Amazon uh, and other other instances of what you might call uh, outsourced reason gone amok. Um, but 
I say that uh, that we can attribute this to just kind of the book marketing because you know uh, there is always this urgency in publishing, even in uh, kind of borderline academic publishing like 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 this book uh, to make your elevator pitch and to uh, and to explain what you mean in uh, in the fewest words possible. Um, but that reduces, I think. Uh, first of all, the essayistic quality of the work, uh, uh, not arguing uh, for a uh, uh, focused uh, 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 thesis of the sort, we are all doomed. Um, I would never do that. I would never think to do that. Um, all I think, and I think again here, uh, it's really helpful to talk about the crises that uh, that you, Richard, have, have have just invoked of the present moment. Um, I think here, what I'm arguing for is a kind of sane management of um, irrationalism, and this is something that we're clearly being forced to do to, to manage the kind of quantity of irrationality sanely in a world where we know we have, for example, anti-vaxxers um, uh, and they're not going to uh, uh, listen to reason. How do you manage the existence of anti-vaxxers while maximizing the benefit of uh, such a large scale campaign of vaccination as the one that's unrolling now and so on. So it's uh, the kind of um, uh, concessions that the book makes to the enduring power of unreason are not saying all attempts at uh, cleaning up the way we think and making policy by use of reason are doomed to failure at the outset. No, no, no. And if I if I come across as saying that, it's because I panicked when someone was coercing an elevator pitch out of me. Uh, <laughs> but the truth is, I, I absolutely agree with you. And um, and and all I'm arguing for is 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 again uh, the, the 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 sane management of this thing that's ineliminable. And I'll just say also that it is good that it's ineliminable because it's also what gives life to art and literature and music and uh, and 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 dreams, right? And uh, so, in a way, uh, the 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 plea for sane rational management of unreason is also at the same time uh, a kind of moderate romanticism um, of kind of uh, 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 pleading for something that is being, to my mind, warped and deformed by, um, by the ubiquitous practice now of applying uh, 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 outsourced rational uh, tools, um, uh, uh, algorithms to, um, uh, to uh, 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 irreducibly human things like, like art and feeling, right? So I, I, I'll stop there. Julian, may I make a quick comment? Yeah, so I, 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 I also was for sort of reasons of advertising picking giving it to the book. But I agree with you. I actually think the book reads not so much as a kind of uh, the Enlightenment is doomed uh, mm. exercise, so much as a kind of cautionary tales from a, a battle-scarred <laughs> warrior who has been out there fighting <laughs> fighting the good battle for reason in many places and, 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 and discovering so often that when you push hardest against your opponent, that's precisely mm. when things yeah. go badly wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I do think there's a, that there is a lot of important lessons in those little mm -hmm. details is mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, the, 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 the confidence that the, uh, the fact that you have reason on your side makes it inevitable that mm -hmm. people will come to a sane understanding of you is, is quite, quite wrong. And right. that if you want uh, the outcomes to be good, it might not be best to sort of pursue them in, in, the, in the service of rationality. It might be to look at ways in which one can can organize the situation so that rationality can best exercise its forces. The, the, the forward to the paperwork, the forward to the paperback edition, I was able to write that last April uh, in the depths of the pandemic. And um, I discussed in some detail there the, um, 
uh, the gatherings that were already forming of religious groups in violation of, uh, of, of, of quarantine. And in a way, this, I think, really brought to a head the challenge and difficulties that I was uh, 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 feeling, but not yet finding ideal examples for when I wrote the book a few years earlier. Okay, thank you. Um, well, we're getting a lot of questions coming in, so I think I will forego my opportunity to ask a question um, and go straight to a question from which, to some extent, I think you already addressed, but nonetheless, it would probably help from Hans Peter Ulrich, um, mm. who's saying we keep uh, in politics, we so often call for rationality, we keep calling for rationality. Is there really no positive definition of rationality, such as simply a logical connection between the goal and the measures designed to achieve that goal? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it often works as a uh, uh, as a, an honorific term, I think, and I think we're seeing this right now in a very interesting and uh, rather despairing example that's unfolding in the context of, let's say, social media debate about politics in the US, um, where you now have people who are aligned more to the, the, the center right right, uh, who uh, think it's a good time to take off our ma masks now that we've been vaccinated. Um, and you have both sides, and then you have people who are aligned, more Democrat, center left, uh, who are saying, no, it's your social duty to keep wearing a mask until the, 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 the authorities tell you not to. Um, and you have both sides uh, at the same time in tandem um, appealing to their uh, uh, capacity to trust the science. This has become a kind of stock phrase. One has to trust the science. Uh, and it's very clear that, um, that this is uh, uh, an empty uh, 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 invocation because we don't know uh, which science <laughs> exactly. And this is a clear example of science being uh, kind of marshaled and, uh, and, and channeled for whatever one already believes for an a priori reason. And I've, ne I've never seen such a clear illustration of this. So I think in political debate, uh, uh, you have to be really wary of the way uh, the way this, this functions as a pseudo descriptive term. Beyond that, I, I do think you know, that, you, that, that, that there's a political sense of rationality invoked in contexts like the kind of ideal of de uh, deliberative democracy, um, where uh, 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 you kind of have people uh, equally openly in good faith committed to uh, reasoning through differences in a way that Leibniz imagined so one day diplomats would be able to say, let us calculate, and they would determine who was wrong, and that would be the end of that. Um, obviously, we don't function that way, but it's a, it's a pretty good ideal. Um, I think that this is curtailed, blocked at every turn uh, by the rise of uh, internet and social mediated uh, social media mediated uh, communication as a sort of pseudo public sphere uh, where uh, it's plain that uh, your uh, well reasoned uh, tweet thread uh, is uh, only kind of going to have any effect at all if it is kind of seized as it were by the forces of unreason and spun into something viral where people attach to it, not because it is uh, compelling as an argument, but because it's, it's hot and it pleases them affectively, right? And so this is the result of having a fake public sphere where only kind of a, 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 a simulation, I could even say a 
parody of deliberative democracy is is working. And without that, I don't I don't know how to have uh, uh, rationality in uh, in democratic participation. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, a question now from Heidi Zamza, I apologize if I don't pronounce that correctly, who's an LSE PhD student in the Department of Psychological and Behavioral Science. How much of this come, just comes from the Greek concept of hubris, or in behavioral economics terms, overconfidence bias? Mm. I don't know, maybe Richard wants to say something about overconfidence bias. That's really interesting. I haven't much thought, I haven't thought much about, about hubris um, before, uh, certainly not in an economic or, or behavioral science sense, but uh, uh, prima facie hub hubris strikes me uh, you know, as in its original sense as when you know you you actually know what you insist you what you actually know what you refuse to acknowledge right um richard um you might like to comment actually um heidi has particularly asked for any comment for any panelist um mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah sure i, I mean uh, yeah actually i think hubris is an important factor but, but 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 not the only one i, I think also uh, I mean, and this is why I was emphasizing kind of unintended uh, consequences of individuals sort of acting, you know, as ideally as one could possibly hope for in, the, in, in these circumstances. So even non-hubristic individuals who are perfectly aware of their own limitations will, by virtue just of the, of the, the, the structure of the circumstances in which they interact, find themselves unable to uh, achieve you know some of the outcomes of which they all wish for. Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, there are these deficiencies that are purely individual, but there are also these kind of um, these obstacles that are hardwired into the structure, you know, into the environment in which mm -hmm. people are are interacting, which are also in yeah. in you know in some contexts are the decisive factors. Well, perhaps I could uh, seize on the reference to behavioral economics to insert the question I did want to uh, talk about. Um, there is a kind of triumph of irrationality going on within economics, mm. um, with, uh, of a rather different kind. I just wondered how it related to your thesis. And this is the, tri the triumph in some sense that, um, uh, that uh, economists have discovered something that psychologists knew many years ago, that mm. people don't always behave according to a set of consistency mm -hmm. really i think a set of rules like transitivity and so mm -hmm. on. um and uh, this is this is certainly being portrayed within the disciplines in some sense a triumph of irrationality over rationality mm -hmm. how do, does this fit in with your thesis or is it uh, just simply a sideline well I, point? I mean i think some of my work is more than some of my other work is um informed by anthropology and uh, by uh, the kind of uh, urgency of taking um, uh, cross-cultural uh, comparison of, um, of what behavior makes sense in what contexts uh, seriously. And that's, that's why the, the kind of case study of um, of, of the Jesuits among the Huron is so, so interesting to me. Um, but beyond that, I'm very interested in some of the cases of, uh, you know, the study of potlatch societies uh, uh, that, um, that uh, put all of their kind of a hope for social status into giving everything away rather than uh, rather than accumulating it, we might be moving to a potlatch society with philanthropy now and the coming ecological crisis. Um, but typically what you see from a cross-cultural point of view is that people will do wildly uh, uh, out of whack things um, if uh, what you take to be in whack, so to speak, is um, accumulating, um, accumulating uh, uh, greatest, uh, let's say, greatest wealth for, your, for yourself as an individual, or extending your life uh, as long as you can, or doing all of these other things that are easy to model, um, in the social sciences, but that people for very complex reasons uh, frequently 
reject, just simply reject, no matter how good the modeled reasons for doing them are. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, the, we've got a question from Sylvia Smola. She, is, I, she says she's an epidemiologist from the US. Uh -huh. Are you saying that the values of the Enlightenment can never be realized, nor are these values accepted universally? What do you say about societies that reject those values? Uh, I, I mean, I, I came to the conclusion that, that Enlightenment is far too nebulous a, 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 a label for, um, uh, for uh, uh, any particular time period uh, or even movement within a particular time period. Uh, you do have people describing themselves as uh, éclairé or as, as, as enlightened, but that means so many different things depending on whether you're in Scotland or Prussia or Paris uh, uh, in the 1750s as opposed to the 1790s. It's just too hard to track. Um, but uh, certainly, uh, broadly speaking, uh, what's easier to identify just as uh, irrationality is easier to identify than rationality uh, in this historical sweep, it seems to me that the counter enlightenment is uh, a real thing that you can really grasp onto. A figure like Jean-Jacques Rousseau in particular in uh, uh, kind of in his uh, hostile uh, 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 a uh, uh, spiteful departure from Paris and his writing in the countryside of all the reasons uh, why uh, the conceit of, uh, of, of progress in our current century and all of the attainments of the great men of science and arts and letters and so on are all just um, uh, 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 vanity, uh, I think, is is something is a is is a real feature of the of the era of Enlightenment, going against a very broad shift in which uh, suddenly people believe that things are going to just keep getting better and better. And someone like Rousseau saying, actually, things were pretty good to begin with. So this is a divide that becomes real in the 18th century and that is with us still today. It's with us in popular works like, like Steven Pinker uh, on the decline of violence uh, over the past several centuries. And it's um, uh, uh, typically, I think, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the Marxist left that is most uh, decisively against the idea that things are getting better. So this is uh, the, the two camps, uh, the two kind of uh, arrows of possible movement of history are still pointing exactly as they have been since the 18th century, even though who picks them up is somewhat different. Um, so given that it's so nebulous, I think uh, it, 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 in, in finally in answer to the question, I think it's impossible to, uh, to dare to say whether it's going to be achieved or not, right? Uh, I certainly agree with Richard uh, and maybe here I can engage a bit more kind of um, uh, feistily uh, with, Richard's, uh, with Richard's comments. I certainly agree with Richard that, um, that every time we do something like uh, work out a game theoretical insight that, uh, that, uh, that or a problem that uh, enables us to distribute vaccinations more effectively or something like that, that is an unmitigated good for society. And I also think that we're getting better and better at that, mostly just because of the accumulation of small labors over time, we're getting better and better at that. And in that respect, um, uh, uh, mutatus mutandus, P Pinker's thesis is kind of right. We're always kind of working out small problems and, and, and battling infectious disease more effectively and so on. Um, uh, uh, I remain worried about the waste products of all of this. I was just reading uh, the pref uh, a chapter, a 
to the second edition of Norbert Wiener's Cybernetics, written in the in the early 1960s. And you know, uh, Wiener says very explicitly, "I can't shake the fear that simply teaching machines to learn to play chess uh, is also contributing." to impending doomsday scenarios. And you might think, well, what, what's wrong with teaching them to play chess? I mean, that's, that, that ought to be something that we can contain. Um, I'm sympathetic to Wiener's view that, um, that, uh, that, that it's more than just managing inevitable side effects of um, progress, but indeed something uh, that, uh, is built into uh, what we experience as progress such that it always poses an actual existential threat. Um, and so, uh, I mean, it's, it's hard to flesh out that conviction and I'm making an appeal to authority here when I say, well, Norbert Wiener said it, um, but, um, but, but I'll just say it's a very tough issue. I'm not blind to what Richard perceives, uh, 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 but part of me, still holds out. <laughs> Could I direct a question to Richard that, that has come through um, from Alex Brown, um, philosophy and conflict student at University of Edinburgh. Can it ever be truly be rational to make decisions in the face of radical uncertainty or indeed imperfect information? Mm. Okay, that sounds like, <laughs> sounds like I wrote the question for him. Uh, uh, <laughs> Yes, but uh, uh, I think part of what it is to respond radically, to, to respond rationally to circumstances that are sort of radically difficult in that kind of way is recognizing upfront how little you know mm. um, and how little control you have on the way things will actually turn out. So, so uh, what it is to be rational in circumstances in those, it involves to a great extent being humble. Um, then when you on the positive side of it, you start. You need to. It requires being clear, being absolutely clear about what you don't know, um, and not uh, and not overextending um, by by sort of work, by working with assumptions that, that you know stuff that you don't know. So so I, I think it's it's difficult to say um, with any kind of in any great. You know, I mean, in any sort of great great detail, exactly what rationality requires of people in these kinds of circumstances, other than these sort of negative remarks. But it, but it does but it does but thinking about these circumstances is an important counterweight to to the kinds of to go back to a previous question, hubristic reasoning, mm -hmm. which is based on on assumptions about knowledge that we don't have. So it's mm -hmm. too often, I think, where sort of the 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 pursuit of of uh, the mandates of the decision sciences have gone wrong is because of assumptions about knowledge that, that are, are misplaced. Um, so rationality in these kind of circumstances consists in being very clear about what you don't know and then making best use of what you do have. Mm -hmm. this, this echoes Descartes in interesting ways who uh, claimed that it's always your choice whether you'll be wrong or not. You have you have the power to never be wrong. Just don't commit. <laughs> um, that's right. So that's and, and I think that's a, that's that's a very very important insight. I mean, the, the, there is this tension always between what you can gain by being, as it were, courageous in what in what you you take take for granted as the basis for your action, yeah. and the avoidance and and the avoidance of error by by limiting the impact, limiting the possibility of being wrong by doing as little as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think these are, you know, these two kind of great pressures to, to exploit the opportunities that are there and to avoid uh, leading ourselves into catastrophe just do push that they, they really do pull in opposite directions. It's mm -hmm. not as if there is a, a, a single optimal reconciliation of those two things. Mm -hmm. To some extent, we just have to sort of decide for ourselves, right, right. decision as it were, whether we, we, we want to be cautious in our response to our circumstances or not. Right. Brave. right, 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 right. But it's it's difficult, isn't it? I, you know, what Descartes wants to say is that is that belief is a kind of an interplay between understanding and will, and so it's the will that brings you forward, and you should never let your will overextend the reach of your understanding. Yeah. Um, 
But you know, if you really think that uh, that that true knowledge is unattainable, and you should remain non-committal on everything, uh, then refusing to over re refusing to extend your will can also start to start to seem like a pretty ir irrational way to conduct your life, right? And that's another example of how it seems like you know everywhere you turn, uh, you you are once again at least being barked at by the specter of irrationality. Yeah, and the, pra the practical version of that worry that Descartes had is, is political paralysis. So when politicians are unwilling to act until there's certainty about things, and I, again, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the sort of response to, to the evidence of the climate changing, but not, but it, for a long period, evidence that was not decisive, yeah. um, can become a reason, can be an, an, an excuse for inactivity. So, so uh, you know, the, the, there's, a, there's a very sort of practical version of, of Descartes' problem is when, right. when, when, when do we have enough certainty to, mm. given what's at stake mm -hmm. to act? Right. Um, right. I'm right. Have to, I think I'm going to have to interrupt. We have, we've got two questions of extreme importance, um, <laughs> one of which has been very highly rated uh, by the audience. Um, and one of which I am determined to know. Um, the, the one that's been very highly rated is um, as a, uh, it's from June Clegg. As a Leibnizian, what do you think of Spinoza's view that the highest kind of knowledge is intuition rather mm. than straight rationality? Mm. And the question that um, uh, I highly rate is from Peter Duxbury. Why is there an asteroid named after Justin? Um, uh, okay. Uh, I, I'll start with the second question. Um, it, it's a, the astronomer who uh, discovered it is a retired Belgian astronomer, and he discovered lots of main belt asteroids, and he has the right, according to the International Astronomical Union, to name them. He's also the president of the Belgian Dobach Society. Dobach the, is the great 18th century Enlightenment materialist philosopher about whom I wrote something in the past. He liked what I wrote. He thought it was important enough to, to merit an asteroid. And there we are. That's, that's the whole story. I, it's, it's, it, I owe it all to that guy. Um, uh, uh, now, about Spinoza and Leibniz, that's so interesting. Um, We've only got uh, two minutes, so I should yeah. say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 as a Leibnizian, um, I am not fully on board with Spinoza's theory of intuition. Uh, I think that uh, Leibniz's idea of, well, what Leibniz and Spinoza both share is this theory of what might paradoxically be called dim omniscience. That is that we all know everything. We just don't uh, know that we know everything and you can flesh it out from our other commitments or what we are aware of. And so in the end, I think Spinoza's theory of knowledge uh, is compatible with Leibniz's at this kind of base level, at the metaphysics of what mind and, uh, and representation are for Leibniz. Um, but, but his kind of not being able to get on board with the theory of intuition, I think, is just uh, 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 a typical kind of reflection of Leibniz's greater caution, which I largely share. Okay, well done. Thank you. Just coming in very nicely in time. So, well, look, it, it remains for me to um, thank um, uh, you both very much, uh, Richard Bradley and Justin Smith, for um, uh, a really stimulating, uh, stimulating uh, talks, uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, and I must say, I'm personally relieved to know that we are not all doomed, and certainly not doomed by um, an asteroid impact uh, <laughs> from uh, the Justin Smith asteroid. Uh, but um, it was very good of you to spare the time to, uh, to take us through this. Uh, it's, um, you said something about the book uh, has come up on the screen. Uh, and so without further ado, as I say, thank you and thank you to the audience for your excellent questions. And I'm sorry we weren't able to get to them all. Um, and um, good night to everybody and have a pleasant evening. Thank, thank you. you. It's a pleasure. Good night.